Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the next installment of OESC in Exile. And we're in Acts chapter 16, and we're going to start reading this morning from verse 16. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God. We're telling you the way to be saved. He kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned round and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews, they're throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely beaten, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet into the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. Jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He replied, Leave in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave, go in peace. Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No, let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates. And when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. Well, last week we saw an example of a spiritually minded woman on the lookout for grace. Lydia's heart had been prepared. She was like a fruit in harvest season, ripe for salvation. God did what only God can do. He opened her heart to respond to Paul's preaching. But we get the impression her heart opened up easily as the Lord applied his spiritual scalpel. There was never a dull day, it seemed, in Paul's missionary in stay in the Roman colony of Philippi. And Luke immediately goes on to relate the stories of how two unlikely people find grace. 
Unlike Lydia, who had been drawn to Judaism from a Gentile background, Luke gives us no indication that these particular people were searching for grace. They were examples of how C.S. Lewis once described his own conversion. I was dragged, kicking and screaming into the kingdom of God, eyes darting left and right for some means of escape. That was true of the slave girl whose story we read of in verses 16 to 18. It took nothing less than an exorcism to drag her out of the clutches of Satan into the kingdom of God. By means of the evil spirit within her, she was able to predict the future. In the pagan and superstitious culture of the ancient world, there was a great demand for fortune telling. This girl was not an exploiter of the public's appetite for clairvoyance. She was a victim. She was being exploited by ruthless men who regarded her as a cash cow in order to earn piles of money as they demanded hefty fees for her spiritualist services. When Paul freed this unfortunate young woman from her demon by casting it out in the name of Jesus, he got himself and Silas into hot water. They'd hit her masters where it hurt, in their wallets. With the removal of the slave girl's demonic powers, their lucrative income stream had immediately been cut off. Paul and Silas made some powerful and vindictive enemies. Her owners seized the missionaries, drag them before the magistrates, pump up false charges against them, and exploit the anti-Semitic prejudices of the crowd. Before Paul and Silas could barely utter a word in their own defence, they find themselves bound to stakes, stripped naked, savagely beaten, and unceremoniously dumped into prison. Ironically, it's just come to light that a, a British national was recently subject to a caning of 24 strokes in a prison in Singapore for drug-related offences. So these severe punishments were not just a practice of antiquity, but still with us today. It's at this point in the story, Paul and Silas meet one of the most improbable men in Acts to experience the grace of God, their jailer. And I'd like to look at this callous man's remarkable encounter with grace this morning under three headings. Firstly, verse 25. Amazing grace. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. In 1997, the best selling Christian book, What's So Amazing About Grace, was published. I think verse 25 demonstrates what is so amazing about grace. Think about it a moment. Paul and Silas had been unjustly and severely punished for performing a noble deed. Due to their intervention, a wretched young girl had not only been liberated from demon possession, but from the abuse of wicked men. They had been treating her as pimps with their prostitutes under their control. Now she had found new life in Christ. Paul and Silas had been vilified as if they were the offenders. They'd been slandered as if they were the bad guys. Their backs had been ripped to shreds by a merciless flogging. If they hoped that this would be the end of their troubles, they were sadly disappointed as their next destination was the city prison. Instruction to the jailer from the city's justice department, if you could call it that, was to guard these insurrectionists closely. Jailer, never one not to take his orders seriously, promptly puts them in the most secure part of the prison, devoid of any natural light. And to demonstrate he was a belt and braces man, he clamps Paul and Silas's feet in stocks. He leaves them in an airless and lightless cell, in discomfort, unable to move around and in pain with bleeding and lacerated backs. What a bleak position they were in. What a miserable place they'd been consigned to. What a terrible hand that life had dealt them. What a faithless God who had led them to this terrible fate. These would be the thoughts 
running through the minds of any normal person. And then we read this mind-blowing verse. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Not sighs, songs. Not grumbling, but glorifying. Not introspection, but intercession. Not self-pity, but praise. How could this possibly be? How could this be huma hum humanly possible? Through grace, through the amazing grace of God. Paul and Silas realized they were not prisoners of Rome, but prisoners for Christ. And Jesus was so real to them in their dark and dingy dungeon, they could not help but worship him. Like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, in Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace, they sensed the presence of the Lord Jesus with them. The Greek is in the past imperfect tense. It could be rendered in English, they were continually praying and singing hymns to God. This went on for some time. No wonder the other prisoners were listening to them. They'd never come across such joy in such desperate surroundings. How Christians with adversity is of course such a powerful witness to unbelievers. Some years ago John Blanchard and his first wife went to their doctor to get some test results for his wife's cancer. They sat down in the consultation room and the doctor said he had some bad news and he seemed to hesitate. But John Blanchard stepped in and made it easier for him. Please don't worry. You can say anything to us. We're Christians. How could they be so calm when the doctor was about to deliver the news that his wife's condition was terminal? Only through grace. Only through a knowledge of the grace of God that came through a lifetime of walking with God. Paul and Silas knew their God and were able to sing his praises in the direst of circumstances. When Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, he wasn't talking theoretically. He was speaking from his own experience. Amazing grace. Secondly, we come to verses 29 and 32 overwhelming grace. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Imagine what the notice the Philippi Evening News said, advertising the vacancy for a city jailer. Wanted, a man hard as nails, not given to touchy-feely emotions to guard the city's hardened criminals. It wasn't a job for a soft-hearted man, but an unemotional one. His job bore a heavy responsibility as he watched over a range of offenders, from those on death row for crimes of violence to those in prison for stealing a, a loaf of bread to feed their families. So when the authorities deliver Paul and Silas into his custody, the jailer treats them with a cold indifference. He does nothing to address the open wounds on their backs. He carries out his instructions to the letter. He puts Paul and Silas in maximum security and fastens their feet in leg irons. Passion doesn't enter into it. Empathy is not a word in the jailer's vocabulary. Sympathy is not what he is paid for has a job to do. He has orders to fulfill, which he duly does. And the fact that he has left two men in clear need of medical attention doesn't seem to have troubled his conscience. The thought of Paul and Silas's condition didn't keep him awake that fateful night. Verse 27 tells us he was sleeping soundly. The two missionaries singing and praying hadn't disturbed him. Unlike the other prisoners who had been listening to them, jailer had been fast asleep. In fact, it took a violent earthquake to rouse him from his deep slumber. And when it did, he was horrified at the scene before him. 
The security of the prison had been badly compromised. The earthquake had dealt a severe blow to the capacity of the prison to keep its inmates incarcerated. Prisoners' shackles come loose and the prison doors had flung wide open. It was the jailer's worst nightmare. What he feared might one day would happen had happened. And the buck stopped with him. He would face the severest consequences if the prisoners awaiting their sentences of death to be carried out escaped. Roman law said the jailer must suffer the same sentence. Execution was done for. That had been the fate of the hapless soldiers guarding Peter when the apostle escaped from Herod's prison in, Jeru in Jerusalem in Acts 12. It would be seemingly is as well. In the image, him being led out for beheading immediately came into the jailer's mind. And he shuddered. There was only one way out of this terrible predicament. Death. His death by his own hand. His suicide. He would fall on his sword rather than face the humiliating and brutal end at the hands of the city's rulers. So he drew his sword in order to plunge it into his own stomach. The tables had been completely reversed. The jailer was now the prisoner. He was a prisoner to his own fears. He was captive to his own worst horror. In his gospel, Matthew records the time Jesus sent out his 12 disciples on mission. He gave them this warning. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That was the jailer. He feared men rather than he feared God. He feared the wrath of the authorities rather than he feared the wrath of God. He feared the judgment of men rather than the judgment of God. He sought a swift exit would enter into a Christless eternity. One commentator puts it so very well. He was a man without hope because he was without God. And so he hovered over hell, unconverted and in the most desperate need of a saviour. Then what happened? Grace arrived. Grace came in the nick of time. All seeing what the jailer was about to do to himself takes command. He takes control of the situation. All knew that although earthquakes were natural events, this earthquake's time is supernatural. This earthquake had not occurred randomly, but providentially. God was in this natural phenomenon, bearing no ill will against the jailer who had been so unsympathetic to their lacerations and had compounded their misery by placing their feet in stocks. All calls out to him, don't harm yourself. We're all present and correct. Not one of us has bolted, not one of us has made a dash for freedom. Seeing it was just as Paul said it was, Jaina knew at once he could spare himself a sword. He knew there was hope. He knew he had a future. Quite what kept the other prisoners from fleeing, we can only speculate. Perhaps they were still in awe of Paul and Silas's ability to praise God in the bleakest of circumstances. Perhaps they were frozen in their cells as they realised the earthquake was the work of Paul and Silas's God. Some of the prisoners were in the condemned man's cell, so why didn't they make a, a run for it? It's astonishing. After all, they had nothing to lose and everything to gain. But perhaps it was an overpowering sense of the reality of God that kept them where they were. Look at the effect this realization he was safe has on the jailer. Falling trembling at Paul and Silas's feet, he asked one of the most famous questions, just not of Acts, but of the entire New Testament. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He had been overwhelmed by grace. He had been overcome by grace. He'd been overpowered by a deep sense of the grace of God. One is the disrespect of the two missionaries. A few moments earlier, they had just been prisoners like any other prisoner under his charge. 
Now he addresses them as sirs. His defences and resistance had been stripped away. Now he realises he must have the ultimate question of life answered, and these men had the answer. Paul's word of reassurance that saved his life. Now his soul needed saving. He'd experienced grace once, now he needed it again. Sirs, what must I do? Although his experience of the grace of God was far more dramatic than Lydia's, the work of God was exactly the same. God had opened Lydia's heart by the tranquility of a river. God had opened the jailer's heart through the trauma of an earthquake and the escape from death by his own hand. Two different hearts had been opened to receive the gospel in vastly different circumstances. The message is always the same. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Quite how God opens the heart to respond to that unchanging, life-giving message varies from Christian to Christian. People become Christians in all sorts of ways. Like Lydia, some are drawn quietly and imperceptibly. The hearts are gradually inclined by the hand of God to embrace the truth. This is the experience of many who grew up in a Christ-centered family and who are exposed to the ministry of God's word and the Holy Spirit in both the home and local church. Others, like the jailer, experience the thunder of an earthquake with their lives seemingly in tatters, but then are suddenly confronted with the offer of the grace of God. I was speaking recently to Glenn Walsh, the pastor of Vine Evangelical Church. In his early 20s, he was in the grip of the drugs. They were his master. Drugs were the reason he got up in the morning. Then he had an encounter with the grace of God. The hold of his drug taking had over him was broken. How could this lock hold of something as powerful as drug addiction be broken? Only through grace. Overwhelming grace. The scale of that grace that knocked the jailer off his feet. Amazing grace, overwhelming grace, and finally, transforming grace. Verse 33. At that, at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately, he and all his household were baptised. Having experienced the overwhelming grace of God that had forced him to his knees, suddenly the jailer's conscience comes to life. It had been perhaps the most dormant part of his makeup. The sheer brutality of the work had dulled the sensitivity of his conscience. He was responsible for keeping cutthroats and villains under lock and key. How he did it was his business. There was little scope, his conscience, he exercised. Now his conscience is quickened. The wounds he had ignored when he imprisoned Paul and Silas in the innermost cell now becomes aware of. They're staring him in the face and they're weeping blood and infection. They so badly need to be treated. So he takes Paul and Silas to his family's quarters and before he does anything else, he washes their wounds. Jada disinfects them. He cleanses them so they can begin to heal. All Silas may be scarred for life, but at least the healing process has begun. And he and all his family are baptised. It wasn't a case of, well, Dad has been baptised. I suppose I ought to be too. No, Luke is quite clear. His family members are not being baptised for his sake. They were being baptised for their own sake. They too, like their father, had come to believe in God. Look at verse 34. It wasn't just that the jailer had been reconnected with his conscience. The jailer's heart had also been renewed. Warm compassion had taken over from cold indifference. And it occurs to him, when did these men last, these two men last eat? Certainly nothing had passed through their lips apart from perhaps some meagre prison rations, since their imprisonment. So he provides them with a meal. 
the jailer thinks and acts practically. He performs a simple act of kindness. One commentator simply notes this. Unless our Christianity makes us kind, it's not real. He has a good deal of biblical justification in making, making that general statement. The fifth of the marks of Christian character in Paul's list of the fruit of the Spirit is kindness. The jailer's spontaneous act of kindness is a clear indication of his regeneration. It was a pointer. He was a new creation. His old self had passed away and the new had come. When Christianity was more mainstream in this country and Britain was perceived at least nominally to be a Christian nation, someone might well say to someone else, well, he's a real Christian. What they meant by that was not that that person was Christian in belief and doctrine, but the one referred to was a kind person. Sadly, this is not a, a term you hear very often today as Christianity has become so marginalized. Traditional Christian beliefs and morality are, are not regarded as kind, but as intolerant. In the past, at least, kindness and Christianity were associated. And rightly so, for kindness is a sign of the new birth. Are you a kind person? Is your day punctuated by little deeds of kindness to others? should be. Kindness is the public face of Christianity. It's what your neighbour notices. Grace transformed a hard man into a kind one. I asked myself this question of the jailer. Now that he'd come to believe in God, now that he'd been filled with joy, now that he'd been converted to Christ, would it be appropriate for him continue working as a jailer? Would it be right for him to work in such a brutalised environment? Wouldn't the very nature of the work contaminate him? I thought about it and included, why not? Someone had to be a city's jailer. Why not a Christian? He'd experience grace. Where better than to display grace himself than in such a place as Philippi's prison, so devoid of grace. What an ambassador for Christ, a kind and compassionate jailer could be. Normally the inmates would expect to be treated as little better than animals. Now the jailer, the recipient of grace, could be the giver of grace. He could treat the prisoners he is responsible for humanely, decently and compassionately. For those prisoners on death row, he could share the hope of the gospel. He too had been without hope and on the point of death, he'd received grace. And so could they at this 11th hour of their lives before their appointment with the executioner's sword. Campbell Morgan relates the story of Bishop John Taylor Smith in his commentary on Acts. Bishop Smith was an honorary chaplain to Queen Victoria and the chaplain general of the British Army in World War I. More importantly than all these offices he held, he was a gospel man. He always used to ask candidates for the army chaplaincy the same question. If I'm a soldier who has been severely wounded on the battlefield and have only three minutes left to live and I'm afraid to die because I do not know Christ, what would you say to me that I may be saved and die with the assurance I am right with God? Now, if the applicant beat around the bush and talked about side issues, Bishop Smith would interject. That will not do. I have only three minutes left to live. Tell me like Paul did to the jailer. What must I do? Another commentator notes. A gospel that cannot save a dying man is no gospel. Do you know the gospel well enough to be able to share it confidently with the dying? That's quite a challenge. I believe the jailer did. He'd been transformed by grace. By remaining in post, he would have literally a captive audience to share the transforming grace of the gospel with others. So out of the darkness 
of dungeons. God's sovereign rule brings about two miracles of grace. Falsely accused, savagely beaten and cruelly imprisoned, Paul and Silas are singing hymns to God at midnight from their cell. Amazing grace. Overcome by the grace of God, their jailer, the most unlikely of men, falls at their feet and asks, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Overwhelming grace. Their jailer becomes their carer and bathes their wounds and gives them a square meal. Transforming grace. And so the nucleus of the church in Philippi is formed. And like all churches should be, it consisted of a mixed bunch of improbable people from all walks of life and all social backgrounds. We have a successful entrepreneur, Lydia, and her household. A former demon possessed slave girl, the city's jailer and his household. Perhaps to some of his former clients after their release from imprisonment. Thus, Paul and Silas's work in Philippi was done for the time being. On their release from prison the very next day, they would visit the church now gathered at Lydia's home and encourage the brothers and sisters in Christ before leaving the city. It would not be until some eight years later that Paul would visit Philippi again during the course of his third missionary journey. It would be approximately another five years after that he would write to the church there in what we know as the letter to the Philippians. Interestingly, in his letter, there is no explicit mention of Lydia, the slave girl, or the jailer. The New Testament does not tell us about their later personal histories. All we know about them for certain is contained here in Acts 16. Each of them was the and a fishery of grace. Each of them had their heart sovereignly opened to receive good news about Jesus. Amen.